What's good y'all, it's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So I wanna check out the dark truth about Daphne's final days. Now, I'm not sure exactly who this particular wrestler was, but uh, apparently this does involve, um, I, I believe it involves uh, something in relations to uh, her uh, taking her own life. I mean, if you actually check the, vi uh, the video, uh, there is a, uh, uh, believe, and let me make myself smaller or disappear real quick so y'all can see. There is a You're Not Alone, uh, a, uh, a, a line that you can uh, talk to someone if you're ever going through uh, a certain situation. Uh, now, here's the thing. It's, YouTube is kind of a crazy place now. Even though they want people to be aware of situations like this, they kind of don't want you to actually, you know, it'll it say the word for whatever reason like they'll they'll flag the video just by even saying the word so that's why i'm not really saying it but you know you know what i'm talking about and if you are going through this before we even get to this video because i don't know the context of how everything happened um if you are going through this definitely talk to somebody this is coming from someone that's been through it that had thoughts and was trying to do certain things my friends came, you know, my mom and, and everyone that, you know, cared about me came to my aid to make sure, you know, they, you know, I was good. And the same here, talk to someone. If you feel like you can't talk to someone, you can. There are lines you can reach out to. So we're going to check this out, see exactly how this played out, man. It's very unfortunate to hear stuff like this. And uh, let's get right into it, man. Okay that's all right what happened here uh the scream queen that's crazy that's live so i don't know what happened it made me refresh it to let me know what i was about to watch Daphne Unger was one of the most underrated female crazy. talents from the 90s and 2000s. Her goth aesthetic and magnetic charisma made her stand out among other women's wrestlers. For a career as iconic as hers, it ended very sadly as multiple concussions due to a hardcore style of wrestling and negligence on the side of her employers led to her developing CTE-related health issues oh, no. and ultimately pushed her into ending her own life after she streamed her final goodbye on Instagram Live in 2021. Oh. No. But how did it all get to this tragic point? And is it the fault of the company she worked for because they didn't take the amount of concussions she suffered at their hands seriously enough? This is the story of the rapid rise and tragic fall of Daphne Unger. Former professional wrestler Daphne Unger has passed away at the age of 46. Damn. Daphne, real name Shannon Sprell, was born on 17 July 1975 in West Germany. She was born into a military family and like many military kids, moved around a lot in her early days. After returning to America when she was only a year old, her family and her began to move around a lot, but eventually the family left America again when they moved to Oxford in the United Kingdom, and it was there that Daphne got her first small taste of the limelight. She appeared in an uncredited role in Santa Claus, the movie, in 1985. Oh, and this wow. experience inspired her to pursue a career in the film industry as she got older. Her family eventually moved back to the USA, and in 1998, Daphne graduated from Georgia State University with a degree in film and video production. Okay. She had full intentions of breaking into the movie industry and began working in media production, taking on various roles from camera operator to set designer. But Daphne's real passion was in acting, and she continued to work behind the scenes in media production in order to pursue her big break in full-time acting. In 1999, Daphne finally got an opportunity for her big break, but not in the most traditional way. WCW had put out an open casting call searching for new talent, and Daphne decided to apply for the contest. WCW ended up liking what they saw and decided to hire Daphne. After training at WCW's power plant, she made her WCW debut on 6th December 1999 as the deranged, obsessive goth girlfriend of David Flair. Daphne Unger's goth oh, look wow. was in line with how she was in real life. As a fan of horror movies, she already had an aesthetic to fit the character that WCW wanted her to play. 
Her dark hair would change colors constantly and she typically wore a collection of shirts with various phrases like Hellion or Hunger for the Unger on them. The goth goddess, as she became to be known, was a blend of Julia Lewis's psychotic character in the film Natural Born Killers and Harley Quinn from Batman. Initially, Daphne tried to get over a maniacal laugh at ringside during Flair's matches but began to notice that audiences would react when she let out a piercing scream. Soon, the scream would become an integral part of the insane Daphne character and this was the birth of one of her nicknames, the Scream Queen. Daphne served as the on-screen manager to Flair and his tag team partner, Crowbar. The group would capture the tag team titles in early 2000 and by May, nearly six months after first appearing on WCW television, the decision was made for Daphne to start to transition into the ring and she would go on to make women's wrestling history when she captured the WCW Cruiserweight Championship, oh, wow. which was a men's only title. This wow. marked only the second time a woman had ever held the Cruiserweight Championship. This was also significant as it came during a time when there were no women specific titles in WCW and therefore women very rarely ever had the opportunity to hold championship gold. Daphne would reign as the champion for two weeks before losing the belt without ever being pinned in a triple threat match. Despite her championship status in the ring, Daphne was never the most polished wrestler during her time in WCW, due in large part to her relative newness within the industry. What Daphne did have in spades, however, was charisma and an on-screen presence that drew fans to her and continually kept her on television. Daphne also had a very good reputation backstage and a good working relationship with the head booker, Vince Russo, and she was very receptive to what producers would tell her and generally got along with all of the talent. However, despite Daphne impressing the higher ups in WCW, she would eventually be released by the company in February of 2001 due to budget cuts, just ahead of the company's own demise a month later. Yeah. Upon leaving WCW and now with name recognition, Daphne decided to stick within the industry and improve on her craft. For the next 8 months, she would train with Dusty Rhodes at the Turnbuckle wow. Championship Wrestling Training Camp in Kennesaw, Georgia. It was also around this time that Chris Jericho claims he first approached WWE about bringing in Daphne, but they rejected the idea because they didn't like her screaming gimmick. She started to make sporadic appearances at various promotions throughout 2002 and 2003, primarily in the role of a manager. She appeared briefly in TNA and she also notably took the role of Lucy Fur in Ring of Honor. As Lucy Fur, she served as the valet for the Second City Saints, consisting of Colt Cabana wow. and her then boyfriend at the time, CM Punk. In July of 2003, Daphne finally got a chance in WWE when she signed a Wait, developmental deal with- she was in a relationship with CM Punk, really? the role of Lucy Fur in Ring of Honor. As Lucy Fur, she served as the valet for the Second City Saints, consisting of Colt Cabana and her then boyfriend at the time, CM Punk. Oh, wow. Okay. In July of 2003, Daphne finally got a chance in WWE when she signed a developmental deal with the company and was sent to Ohio Valley Wrestling. There, she was once again assigned to be a manager. She never really got traction with WWE however and was released from the company in December of that year. Discouraged by the lack of momentum in her career over the past few years, Daphne decided to retire from professional wrestling in order to focus on her career in acting. She was so serious about this retirement decision that she actually sold her wrestling boots to her roommate at the time, Mickey James. What? Around this time as well, she was f Wow. It's really crazy how the wrestling world is kind of interconnected. That's crazy. First diagnosed with being bipolar. This was the first indication of any form of mental illness she may be suffering from. Had this been the end for Daphne, it would have been a mildly successful, if altogether insignificant story. She had parlayed an open casting call into winning a male dominated championship in one of the biggest wrestling companies in the world and had put together a 4 year career where she earned public recognition and emerged from the business relatively healthy. However, her retirement following the release from WWE wouldn't be the last we heard of Daphne and it would be in the second half of her career that Daphne's life would forever change. Uh -oh. During her hiatus from the squared circle, she worked as a personal trainer as she again attempted to jumpstart her acting career. During her time away from the ring, she also decided to do a triple X-rated photo shoot for the pay site owned by former wrestlers Missy Hyatt and Francine. Despite her retiring, it wasn't long before Daphne began to fall back in love with professional wrestling and was prompted to unretire. Daphne would finally be thrust back into the pro wrestling spotlight in December of 2008 when she reappeared in TNA. 
This time around in TNA, she wasn't playing her old, unhinged character. Instead, she got to flex her acting chops when she appeared as a parody of Alaska governor and former vice presidential candidate, Sarah Palin. I think the I odd storyline involved the team of the beautiful people, believing Daphne to actually be the recognizable politician. Daphne, for her part, made herself look strikingly like Palin and even used her distinctive accent when giving promos. It would eventually be revealed. Yeah, I think I, I do remember that for a little bit. I, I think I briefly remember that. Feel that Daphne wasn't really Sarah Palin, and there was all a ruse set up by Taylor Wilde and Roxy Laveau to make the beautiful people look like fools. Daphne then took the moniker of the governor and continued her feud with the beautiful people, notably appearing in ring on a consistent basis for one of the first times in her career. Following an upset victory over Madison Rain, the governor was knocked out and had her hair forcibly cut by the beautiful people. This led to a mental breakdown from the governor, resulting in a return of the unhinged character of Daphne for the first time on American television since 2001. However, as cool as the character change was, it was precisely at this moment where Daphne started to get multiple concussions as she was involved in many violent and chaotic oh, match types. No. She participated in a Queen of the Cage match at Lockdown 2009 and in this match she suffered a concussion. She also competed in the first ever Women's Monster Ball, which is a match type that is notoriously violent at sacrifice only a month later against Taylor Wilde. The chaotic six minute affair saw Daphne take multiple blows to the head with weapons, spanning from trash cans to baking sheets, resulting in another concussion. Following a falling out with Abyss, Daphne aligned herself with Raven and again appeared in a monster's ball match at Slammiversary in June. This time it was a mixed tag affair, another first of its kind, with Raven and Daphne taking on Abyss and Wild. The climax of the match saw Daphne slammed into a pile of thumbtacks by oh. Wild. Only four days later, Daphne and Wild participated in the first ever match of 10,000 tacks, which again saw Daphne once again slammed into a pile oh. of thumbtacks. The violent rivalry came to an end at Bound for Glory in October, but it was there that Daphne would finally feel the consequences of so many violent matches. The event featured another Monsters Ball match, and this time between Abyss and Mick Foley, with Dr. Stevie serving as a special guest referee. Midway through the match, Daphne interfered in order to help defeat Dr. Stevie's nemesis, Abyss. This resulted in Abyss chokeslamming Daphne from the ring apron through a table on the outside covered in barbed wire. Ooh. Initial reports from the match were that Daphne suffered a legitimate broken arm from the high spot, but it would eventually be revealed that Daphne had suffered yet another concussion. Hey y'all. This is... Hey, once again, it's crazy what these men and women are willing to do just to entertain us bro i don't think i mean we say it all the time but i don't think we really understand <laughs> the amount of pain that these people put their bodies through just to entertain us for 20 30 minutes at a time it's crazy man this spot has garnered a lot of criticism over the years, not just for its resulting injury, but because of everything that happened behind the scenes in the lead up and aftermath of it. Daphne did not want to take the dangerous bump, but was encouraged by head booker Vince Russo, with him insisting that everything would be fine. Daphne was finally convinced when Mick Foley suggested that the spot could become as memorable as his legendary death-defying oh, plunge no. off of the Hell in the Cell Cage at the King of the Ring 1998. Following the spot and her injury, TNA was only willing to pay Daphne $600 for her medical bills, but it was a problem because her medical bills totaled over $26,000. Bro, what? You encourage this person to do it, and then you only want to pay them $600, bro? Alright, bro. Despite her injury, it had become clear that Daphne had improved tremendously in the ring since her days in WCW, highlighted by being listed as the 18th best female wrestler by Pro Wrestling Insider in 2009. Her willingness to do whatever it took to entertain the fans and TNA's insistence on turning her into an extreme match wrestler helped catapult her into a high profile position within the company, but the double edged sword to this mindset is that it boxed Daphne into a wrestler who had to frequently continue to push the envelope in increasing 
increasingly yeah. more violent matches. This was also taking place at a time nearly two years before TNA banned unprotected chair shots to the head, meaning oh, that there was an no. expectation for more reckless wrestling and spots. In many ways, it was only a matter of time before Daphne suffered a serious injury like the one she did at Bound for Glory. Upon her return, Daphne had set her sights on acquiring gold within TNA. She faced off against the TNA champion Tara in a first blood match with the championship on the line. The short but violent match saw the two women fight all over the arena and concluded when Daphne was hit very hardly over the head with a toolbox, oh. causing her to lose the match. Even though it felt as though Daphne was on the precipice of greatness in TNA, it seemed like management were never truly behind her and wanted her to be at the top of the mountain. Not long after this match, Daphne would suffer her greatest injury and concussion yet. Daphne had a dark tryout match with a new prospect, Rosie Lodderlove. Late in the match, Lodderlove hit a sit-down slam on Daphne's head, which severely injured her. Oh. Daphne was taken to a hospital following the match and was diagnosed with a deeply bruised sternum, a severe stinger, and another serious concussion. Once again, TNA failed to pick up Daphne's medical bills, and although the match and resulting injury happened during a dark match, TNA ended up showing the footage on television and actually signed Lotta Love. As it turns out, Lotta Love was trained by Bubba Ray Dudley as part of his Team 3 Academy of Professional Wrestling and Sports Entertainment, and Bubba Ray had enough influence within TNA to get her a tryout match and ensure that she was hired. However, it didn't oh, wow. save Lotta Love from being let go of the company after only two months due to consistent poor performance performances, but Bubba Ray placed the blame for his student's quick departure on Daphne. He reportedly screamed at Daphne backstage for making him and Lotta Love look bad and held a grudge against her for the rest of her time in the company. Daphne really? eventually healed from this injury and was- I don't know about that one, man. I don't know about that one. That one's kind of, from the looks of it, it seemed like the other person botched it, so I don't know about that one, man. I don't know. that. I don't know about that one. Just from that clip, it don't look like she would be at fault there. How would... I don't know. Cleared for in-ring action, and she did manage to return to TNA for two more matches in 2010, but on March 15th, 2011, Daphne's contract with TNA expired and was not renewed. This wouldn't be the end of Daphne's involvement with TNA, however. On the same day that she announced her contract was not renewed, Daphne revealed that she had filed a workers' compensation claim against TNA months earlier due to the feeling that she was put in an unsafe working environment and TNA's mm. lack of financial coverage of the injuries she suffered while with the company. Understandably so. If the lawsuit had anything to do with TNA not renewing her contract, Daphne filed it as a failsafe in case she was let go. The lawsuit had the potential to be an absolute landscape changer not just for tna but for professional wrestling as a whole yeah essentially daphne was arguing that because she suffered her injuries at the behest of tna and because her injuries most likely would prevent her from ever wrestling again that tna should be responsible for covering all of her medical bills instead of the paltry amount that they actually did in order to do this though daphne would have to legally be considered an employee of tna this would be a drastic change from how wrestlers were normally mm. considered, which is as independent contractors. Mm. This legal loophole is typically what wrestling companies use to absolve themselves of all legal responsibilities towards wrestlers, as they can claim that all of the wrestlers are merely contracted yep. instead of employed. If the court ended up ruling in Daphne's favor, however, it would have set the precedent for all wrestlers to claim to be fully-fledged employees of their respective companies. This would not only result in companies like TNA and WWE being forced to handle all of their talent's medical expenses, but could even potentially lead to the wrestlers, now being considered to be full employees, to seek unionization. Mm. Looking to save face and to protect their assets, TNA ended up settling with Daphne in 2013, just before the two sides were set to go to court. Unfortunately, Daphne was never quite the same after her time in TNA. Her injuries forced her into retirement from the ring, though she did continue to make sporadic appearances as a manager on the independent circuit. 
Even those appearances started to end though, as Daphne began to suffer from an early onset of menopause and severe depression as a result of her brain injuries. This caused her to gain a considerable amount of weight and she became self-conscious and embarrassed of her new image, so she shied away from the limelight and public appearances. Her life was truly starting to fall apart and in 2011, she was charged with a DUI and was sentenced to one year probation. In 2012, she was involved in a serious car accident that could have killed her had she not been wearing a seatbelt. Despite all of this, Daphne's biggest issues continue to be from the concussions that she suffered in those extreme spots in TNA. Over the years, her headaches and CTE began to get worse, with Daphne even claiming that she would have to watch movies multiple times because she couldn't remember what it was that oh, she had just no. watched. Many days she had to cover her windows with blankets because the sunlight bothered her eyes and gave her headaches. All of this is telltale signs of CTE. In 2017, Daphne began to speak out about the effects of concussions on wrestlers. She explicitly stated that her concussions had ended her career and advised future wrestlers to take time off after taking blows to the head. Things then took a turn- Which they do now. If y'all don't, they don't play that shit. If somebody claims to have gotten a concussion, they are gonna take some time off, as you should. I mean, you seen it in the NFL, they don't play that no more. You, get, you have any type of injury to the head, you're going to take some weeks off, as you should. Let the brain heal. So. And for the worst, on September 1, 2021, Daphne's depression had gotten worse over the years, and on that day, she appeared on a live stream on Instagram. There, she began to read what would appear to be a suit side note while holding a pistol. Oh, Countless no. wrestlers and friends tuned into the manic stream and tried to contact Daphne throughout. Daphne also kept insisting that her brain be sent to Boston, a reference to the Concussion and CTE Institute at Boston University, started by former pro wrestler Chris Nowinski, uh -huh. who also studied Chris Benoit's brain. The stream was finally halted and law enforcement was sent to Daphne's address at the behest of concerned fans and colleagues. But what they found was shocking as they found Daphne Unger dead at the age of 46 years old. Yeah, man. That's really sad and unfortunate, bro. I ain't gonna lie to you. The next day, it was revealed that Daphne had taken her own life via a gunshot wound to the chest. Per her request, her brain was taken to the Boston University CTE Center for Analysis. Dozens of wrestlers took to social media to both mourn the loss and to call for better mental health awareness within the industry. Daphne's self-inflicted death was the third such instance from female wrestlers within two years, and there yeah. were calls from wrestlers for more promotions to provide mental health services to their wrestlers. TNA featured a number of tributes to Daphne in subsequent weeks. The story of Daphne Unger is so tragic because, in many ways, it was so preventable. Unlike many other wrestlers who met early and tragic demises, Daphne was not addicted to drugs or an yeah. alcoholic. She didn't have a traumatic upbringing and she rarely, if ever, caused any drama backstage. Yeah. And the reactions from the wrestling community in her final hours and after her passing showed that she was actually a beloved and respected figure in professional wrestling. Her magnetic personality and vibrant persona allowed her to become a popular trailblazer in a shockingly short amount of time. She shined bright in WCW and TNA, and even though her lawsuit didn't completely go all the way through, Daphne was on the precipice of changing the rights of professional wrestlers forever. In some way, TNA can bear some responsibility for Daphne's death. TNA insisted on her becoming an extreme match wrestler mm -hmm. and time and time again pressed Daphne into doing more and more dangerous stunts, resulting in injuries she could never recover from. But even as her mental health deteriorated, Daphne continued to look out for the future of the industry. And although Daphne's death is certainly a tragedy, some solace can be taken that it has resulted in more open discussions among professional wrestlers about mental health and the need to protect their brains. Daphne may not have been in the industry for very long, but it impact inside and outside of the ring is undeniable and she should be remembered as one of the true trailblazers in women's wrestling oh for sure bro i i didn't know anything Daphne about had an this unfortunate ending to her life and another women's wrestling star who also had an unfortunate ending to her life was miss elizabeth there's a conspiracy theory that lex luger was the one who murdered miss elizabeth if you'd like to see the video on this conspiracy theory that's crazy man yeah this 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 was a tough one uh saw this in the sub box 
and I wanted to check it out because, you know, I didn't understand, you know, know the context of what was going on. It's very unfortunate. Um, you hate to hear that. She wasn't a toxic individual behind the scenes. She wasn't addicted to drugs. It's just she was willing to go out there, put her body on the line when the company wanted her to. Ended up getting injured. They didn't even want to compensate for the injuries or even help with the payment of the injuries. And over time, getting concussions and going back out there, doing these dangerous matches to get a potential another concussion, it caught up. It caught up to her. And it's, it's very unfortunate. And you hate to see things like this happen. But at the same time, it puts a spotlight on what's going on in the wrestling business that needs to be changed. And you hate for someone to actually have to lose their life for that change to happen. But as y'all see now, they are very strict with concussions. They're very strict with anything dealing with head injuries. They don't play that as they should be. Because at the end of the day, these people deserve to have a life outside of the wrestling so prayers go out to her family and friends that's a tough one man that's a tough one and this is why we always say show love and respect to these wrestlers out here no matter what company they they're you know wrestling for like because at the end of the day they are literally putting their lives on the line to entertain us and uh, it's it's very unfortunate man so but comment down below. Let me know some other wrestling videos y'all want me to check out. I definitely will. Appreciate all the love and support y'all showing on the channel. Road to 150K. Appreciate y'all kicking it with me. See y'all next one. Peace.